little harder and say, praise ye the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. It's good to be home. We greet you in Jesus' name. I'll let you stand just for a moment. I'll be standing longer than you. Amen. And it's good to be back in Wisconsin. And uh, a lot of you don't know that this is home to me. My grandparents moved from Shalep to Sweden at the turn of the century and ended up near Superior, Wisconsin, a place called Dairyland. A little community. Three, three Swedish brothers carved out the land. My grandfather, Anton Larson, and that that's the story. And so Wisconsin's mighty important to me because it's my roots. And it's good to see all of you. Last time we were here was 2002. We've got older and fatter, but the Lord is still the same. Amen? Amen. And uh, I'm just having to laugh at the things that have happened the last five days, but it's so good to see Brother and Sister Putnam, love them very, very much, have the highest respect for your leader of this district, missionary, general board. They have been in every method of service as true servants of the Lord, and we've known them a long time. It's so good to see Brother and Sister Kasky. I've known them since I was a small boy. And then, of course, we mentioned Brother Shalm, one of my favorite people, Brother and Sister Shalm. We've traveled with them all over the world and been in many places teaching together and uh, it's just special to have him I might have to have him help me preach tonight he's just he makes things happen Manuel Rogers his wife is my cousin good to see them brother Joe Ellis is just on and on and on yesterday my wife and I were driving uh, out the freeway or the highway that goes through Thorpe through Torp and uh, I, I said to her I used to go to this church in Torp many times as a boy, and there was about 50 people out in a little uh, community church. We saw this monstrosity of a church, and I said, wait a minute, that said apostolic church, that has to turn the car around. We went three miles, turned around, came back. It was the United Pentecostal Church of Torp, Wisconsin. Not only was it impressive, gymnasium, 250 seats, it just blew my mind what God had done in that church, Brother Hildebrand. Good to see you. But along with it, we walked in and they were having a red-hot prayer meeting, 24-hour prayer chain. I walked right into a bunch of strangers and I said, hey, I need prayer. Lay hands on me. You're in the spirit. We just had a good tongue-talking time for a few minutes there. That refreshed my soul. Amen. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to preach long tonight. Amen. I'm not going to do five more minutes like Jeff Arnold, but uh, give me a chance to say I'm just I'm just laughing at the last few days uh, because so many things have happened in the last four days. I I picked up the newspaper four days ago. Headlines on the second section section: James Larson killed instantly in head-on collision. James Larson of San Diego. I said, wow. He was a Swede from Minnesota. I'm a Swede from Minnesota. That got my attention, number one. Then I lost my 10-year uh, telephone with a 1,000 names on it. It's gone. I couldn't call Brother Putnam. Then Sister Darlene Boyd called and said she wouldn't be here tonight. Great job on the music. Give them a hand tonight. She had lost her nephew. You might be pitching a pity, a pity party just for a moment. Serve a little pout soup. A twin in our church, a twin back in Phoenix, died of a heart attack. All of this happened in the last four days. And uh, then I got on a flight, and it is the worst flight I've been on in 25 years. We were flying into Denver, coming in in a big storm, and they said, Abort the flight, go to Colorado Springs. They turned us around to Colorado Springs. They said, turn it around, go back to Denver. We came into Denver with wind shear. That plane bucked left. I've never felt that in my life. My blood went up in my head. I thought we were going to die. Then it bucked right, and it was turning this way. It was something else. Hallelujah. Well, I prayed through. I promise you that. And it's good to see everybody tonight. 
God bless you. Thank for thank you for everything. The other thing I did is I picked up a rock about three days ago, and I heard my lumbar pop. And uh, I haven't done this in 10 years. I couldn't even walk three days ago. Couldn't even walk. And thank God for those prayers. Amen. The Deerling family in the form. I'm glad to be up here walking tonight. Amen. Second Corinthians. I'm just trying to tell you, I think we're going to have a camp meeting because the devil's trying to spoil the whole thing. I heard the good reports last week of a outpouring of the Holy Ghost, so it's already warmed up. Let's go. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 7. Everybody say hallelujah. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yes, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down and not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be seen or manifested in our body. Would you say amen? Verse 16, to finish out, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed at a camp meeting in Wisconsin. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I want to preach about all in a moment. Now I got a little bit of my wires crossed. I thought I heard that tonight was going to be a graduation service with graduates in front of me and this is what is going to be a little different on Sunday night. You've already had a graduation service. I missed it. And I got a graduation message. We're going to turn it into a one God apostolic message, all right? Let's have church tonight. Turn to somebody and say the preachers after you. Would you shake their hand? The preachers after you, you may be seated. God bless you in Jesus' name. I want to thank everybody tonight on this district board, all of the leaders, the teachers, the pastors. I want to personally thank everybody that has lended your gifts and talents, your energy and your abilities to make everything come to pass to start this camp meeting. God sees your effort, and he will reward it. Now, before Christ, B.C., in James Larson's life, I was as close to nobody as you could ever find around. I was the baby of five children. I was the late-life child. All of my brothers and sisters are in their 60s. I'm in my middle 50s. And uh, I was the kid that was the black sheep of the family. I caused my parents a lot of trouble at 15. And until the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life, my life was pretty uneventful. But I came to some camp meetings in Wisconsin as a child. How many remember the Mangan camp meetings? Anybody remember the Mangan camp meetings and the Ruth and the Frank Muncie camp meetings? I was one of the boys right down in this area here, talking in tongues, praying through to the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Since I gave my life to the Lord, I want to tell everybody here, nobody on this planet has helped me and endorsed me better and more than Jesus Christ. He makes a way when there seems to be no way. God has been more than good to me. But as you get a little bit older, you won't find me on the ball field this week because I've got a little older. And you get a little bit older, your life begins to narrow down. Now to this new pastor, God bless him, I know I'm never going to be a star running back for the Green Bay Packers. It has finally settled in. Life is narrowing down. I'm not going to play in the World Series for the Milwaukee Brewers. I'm probably never going to become a SEAL 
basic underwater demolition, sea, air, and land, and be one of the guys that catches the man over in Pakistan by the name of Osama bin Laden. I'm probably never going to build a city like Dubai, be a great builder, or be like my wife's hero, her dad, Clyde J. Haney, who was an absolute real cowboy who rode the range. Life is narrowing down. But I appreciate the tremendous goodness of God in 2010. How about you? In the middle of a tough economy, how many are glad that God's been faithful to you? Amen. One thing I've learned in over 50 years of life is life does not come down to seconds and minutes and hours and days and months and years and decades. That is what life is not all about. Life comes down to something far more important than a few years and a few days. You see, I'm going to be a better man for being here this week and getting to know you. But the scripture says in the book of Matthew chapter 4, it says that Jesus was taken to a high precipice and Satan, the devil, this really happened, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Jesus and the devil, Satan and the almighty God were having a conversation and Satan shows him the whole universe and the kingdoms of the world in a moment. It all happened in a moment. It all happened in that short span of time. Now, the word moment to the Jewish mind, that's a, that's a difficult word because a moment is an indivisible amount of time. It's difficult for a Jew to figure that word moment out because it comes from the word atmos, which is the root word of Adam. A-T-O-M. Man always believed that he can split an atom. You cannot split an atom in half. An atom is the smallest, most indivisible substance known to man. Now, we can cut this service in half. We can cut my message in half. You can cut a minute in half. You can cut an hour in half, half an hour. You can cut a day in half. You can cut a month in half. You can cut a year in half. But there's no such thing as half a moment. It's not going to happen. A moment is indivisible. It's the smallest portion of time to the Jewish mind. So Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The one moment of time that becomes the most important to you and I is that moment in history. Because if Jesus would have bowed, if Jesus would have cowed, if Jesus would have bent then everybody's salvation in this building tonight would have gone to hell. Aren't you glad that Jesus did not bend? But it all happened in a moment. It didn't happen in a day or an hour or a few weeks. It was the moment. Listen to me. I have preached hundreds of funerals. Hundreds. I've been with a lot of people when they died and they left this world to go to the next one. Brother Putnam, Calvary Tabernacle, had a lot of old folks. There was times that there would be three funerals in one week. A lot of people. And so you live 75 or 80 years. I hope you do. And when, when you get done and you have closed your eyes in death, they're going to come to your preacher, your pastor in this district, and they're going to say, we want you to preach dad's funeral or mom's funeral or sissy's funeral whoever it is. And you know what? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here tonight. But probably, if we dig real hard, the best we're going to do is come up with about 30 good minutes about you. We'll work real hard to find some interesting things to say about you when you die. And people are going to come and look at your stone-cold body and they're going to think about you. But folks, I'm going to be truthful. The only thing they want to hear about is a few highlights about your life. Most folks are going to come to your funeral, and the first thing they want to do is after they drop you in the ground, go back to the church and have potato salad in Jesus' name on you. 
And they're going to laugh and ask for another piece of apple pie. And that's the reality of this world. Because all we really care about are the few months in your life that really matter. Everything in life comes down to a few special, wonderful moments. The moment you decide to be saved. The moment you decide to get baptized in Jesus' name. The moment you decide to seek the Holy Ghost and God fills you with the Holy Ghost till you speak with other tongues. The moment, hallelujah, you decide who you're going to get married to, and there's a few thinking about it here tonight. The moment you decide after marriage to have a baby and you see God give you that child and then the years go by and it's a grandchild. Everything in life is mundane and daily. It revolves around a moment, a special moment in life. That's all that really matters. If your dad lives to be a hundred, I've had him come to me. Dad just died. He was a hundred. Hey, Brother Larson, he's got no friends alive. They're all dead. All of his buddies are dead. Everybody's dead. Can't you knock it down to about 15 minutes? Wait a minute. Your dad lived a hundred years. He lived a hundred years. He's a centurion. And you want me to put him in the hole in the ground in 15 minutes and he lived 100 years. You see, folks don't care about what you've done. They want to know about the special moment. If Satan can steal your moments, he can steal your life. Satan will give you the, the years, the decades, the minutes and the hours, but he wants your moments. Those special moments of life Somebody clap your hands to the Lord tonight. How many people in the audience tonight, Brother Shalom, have done a, 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 an acute study of the 900 years that Adam lived? I mean, weeks, months, years, Adam's life. Have you studied it out? No. You don't care about Adam. All you want to know is what he did in the garden, how he blew it in the garden, and how he got kicked out of the garden. That's it. That's the moments. That's a few things about, about Adam that anybody ever cares about. And then you move down the list and you get to Methuselah. He lived how many years? 969 years. The guy lived longer than any human being that's ever lived. He would have seen every major thing that happened in human history of the last thousand years if he had lived in our time. But he lived 969 years. He gets one scripture in the whole book. That's all he gets. And his name meant sending forth water in the day of his death. Hallelujah. That's all it was about. He was born to warn a generation that the water's coming, the flood's coming, and when I die, you better find a boat. That's the only moment we remember about him. Noah. Noah, after he came out of the ark. Folks, a lot of us don't realize this. He lived 350 years. 300 50 years. You don't care about that. You just care about at 100 when he started building that boat. And eight souls were saved by water. He gets out of the incredible, incredible ark. And anytime you get hungry this week and, and you get a real desire for chicken and you want some real good roast beef or a hamburger with extra cheese, you thank God for Noah because if it hadn't been for Noah getting that chicken on the ark and that beef on the ark, hallelujah, and some of that other stuff on the ark, you wouldn't be eating it. So somebody clap your hands for Noah. Noah ministered to you today. Noah blessed you today. But after he got out of the ark... He built, Brother Welch, a nice corn farm and lots of stuff. And he took the grapes and he stepped on them and he made wine and he got drunk. God's man that saved the world got drunk. He got naked. He was shamed in his tent, laying in his tent with a big old headache. Everybody here tonight remembers Noah and the ark. We remember what Noah did in the ark, but he really had no great moments after the flood. 
Woo! So our lives, it's Wisconsin. We're back here again. It's a camp meeting. And we look and see that there's a moment of time here and a moment of time there that is so very important. Just one little atom, one little atom of time, one little time that resolves around everything else. If I miss what God wants in my life, if I miss what God plans for my life, if I miss God and what he wants to do in my life, I've missed everything. That's the greatest moment of all. The rest of your life is meaningless. No, let's, let's just be real, folks. You get up the same way, the same, the same every day. You go to the same mirror, look at the same ugly face, take the same washcloth, wipe it the same way, put your same clothes on, get on the same driveway, go down the same streets to the same red lights, go see the same cigar-smoking boss and work eight hours. Hallelujah. Get back tired, fight the traffic, hallelujah, take the same shower, go to the same church, praise God. I'm not going to say the same sermon. Praise the Lord, he'll change that. But we look around and, and, and you're shaving every day and you're filling your gas tank and you're waiting on some kind of a mundane elevator to finally get on the floor you're at. We're not interested in the mundane things. You will live all of time on earth and nobody has an interest of all the Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays that you've ever lived 52 weeks a year when it comes down to did you have an experience with the Holy Ghost in fire did you have a touch of God the splitting of an atom is the greatest power known to man it causes a chain reaction it causes atomic bombs your marriage and your home and your relationship, I'm preaching to it tonight. Marriage has never been under such an attack in the history of the world. Your marriage and your home and your relationship, it's the greatest thing you've got. And when you break down society and you get past grandparents and kids and grandkids and all of it, it comes down to two people, a man and a woman. God made them male and made them female. Does anybody still believe that around here? There was two sexes, two sexes. What happens when you split an atom? What happens when you split a family? What happens when you split the kids up and you split the marriage up? Now you got two families. Now you got three families. Do you have more atoms? No, you've got more splinters. You've got more pain. You've got more sorrow. You split one atom, you've got other atoms. What's it called? Hiroshima, Nagasaki. You'll see a mushroom cloud, a gigantic explosion, and steel girders will melt like spaghetti in hot water because of the atoms. And the whole world is in a race tonight. Pakistan has the nuclear bomb. Korea has the nuclear bomb. Iran has the nuclear bomb. We're coming down to the end of the age. I would double think twice before I split my marriage or split my home or split my family because you split everything that goes with it and you end up with the greatest catastrophe the world has ever seen. It's the dividing of life, the lowest denominator. It's the relationship of society. It's the human fabric that's woven into the success factor of man upon this planet. God said marriage is indivisible. Somebody see it. Indivisible. You cannot tear it. You cleave to your wife and to your wife only. You cannot tear it apart. Stay together. It's the substance of a compound that what God planned would make the world great. When you change it, you get same-sex marriages. Steve and Bill getting married. Sue and Mary getting married. What's that do? It splits up the whole world until the biblical picture is given to us of a city called Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says the day came that fire rained upon Sodom. In other words, you've got nothing but a trash heap. You've got nothing but a mess. And when people around the world get tattoos, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you got a tattoo tonight. The whole world's getting tattooed. The whole world's getting tattooed. But if you take a tattoo and you look at a tattoo, they used to put it on servants and slaves. A tattoo really is referred to by the prick of a needle and 
oil or ink that goes into your body, and it's called an atmos. Again. So, you break the tattoo down. When you get one prick of the needle into your skin, boom, it shoots the ink in. You don't have the whole picture yet. You can't divide that. It's like an atom. You can't divide that. Every prick of the needle goes in and all the little dots go together. And finally, thousands of dots make up a picture. Your life started 20, 30, 50 years ago. And there was the first dot of the pen. And the first beginning of your life. And all of the tattoo has been coming together. A picture is being placed upon your life. What you are and what you're doing with your life tonight. And I want to tell you, I'd rather have a tattoo with Jesus than a tattoo with the devil. I want the Lord to be my king and my savior. I went to high school, and I remember sitting in that big auditorium, Murray High School, St. Paul, Minnesota, and they said, what are you going to do with your life? What are your goals? Write them down. And I wrote it down, baseball player, president, going to be this or that. I want to tell you a lot of the goals you'll ever have in your life, they'll never happen. Sorry about the books of success. Why won't they happen, Brother Larson? Because God has a plan with your life. God wants to tremendously, dynamically change your life in a moment of time. It can happen at this altar in the next 10 minutes. It can happen with the Holy Ghost coming down. It can happen with a cancer being healed. It can happen with a backslider praying through and going back to that bar and saying, I'm living for God now. It all comes down to a moment. Your life comes down to a moment. Your life is all about a great spiritual moment. Clap your hands to the Lord. They tell me, I'm going to wind down here, that they took a survey of all of the old folks' homes in America. They asked thousands and ten thousands of people sitting in wheelchairs and convalescent homes, if you could live your life over again, what would you do different? And they got three predominant answers. Number one, if I could only live life over again, I would take more time to smell the coffee or appreciate my loved ones. I'd hug my loved ones. I'd kiss my loved ones. I'd tell them I love them. That's what old people said if they could live life over again. The second predominant theme was, I would take more risks. Oh, God bless the risk takers. And the third thing that they said, I would do more things that will live on after I'm dead. Teddy Stollard was a kindergartner. He was an excellent student. He was doing well, and his mother died. And when his mother died, in the second, third, and fourth grades, he began to lose interest in school. He would answer his teacher, Mrs. Thompson, Jean Thompson, in monosyllables, huh, what, yeah, I don't know. And the mother, after dying of cancer, his father was nonchalant, not interested in Teddy. He was failing. He was lost in the system. His teacher would get big red Fs and put on his paper, failure, and circle it. Teddy was another loser. And Christmas came. All of the bright kids, come on, musicians, all of the bright kids brought sparkly, colorful, beautiful gifts with big ribbons and gave them to Mrs. Thompson. And she was holding them and opening them up and looked at each gift and she'd go, oh, look at this. And the kids would all take cue. Oh, yeah. And they'd clap their hands. It was beautiful, the gifts that parents had thought to send with their kids. Mrs. Thompson got to Teddy Stollard's gift. A real story, a real man. And it was a lunch bag. He had put his mother's half-used perfume in the lunch bag, folded it over, and put gaudy tape. And with a Crayola, he wrote to Miss Thompson, Love, Teddy Stollard. When she 
ripped open that bag and pulled out the half-used bottle of perfume, she began to laugh. And the kids took the cue, and everybody began to laugh at Teddy again. Head down between his legs, Teddy's a loser. She saw the devastation in his face. She said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that's my favorite perfume. She, she sprayed it all over. She said, Teddy, that's my favorite perfume. And all the kids began to cheer. Class got over that day. You listen to me, teachers. You listen to me, students. You listen to me, saints of God. You listen to me, Sunday school people. Class got over that day, and everybody left except Teddy. He stood in front of Mrs. Jean Thompson's desk, and he said, Miss Thompson, today you smelled like my mother all day. I want to thank you, Miss Thompson, for liking my gift. I love you. When he walked out the door, she got down by her desk and she said, God, forgive me for injuring that boy. I'm going to dedicate myself to that one little boy the rest of this year. That God would touch that child. School came and went. Teddy Stollard graduated from high school. Miss Jean Thompson sitting on the front row. Sally Lotaria second in his class he went on to medical school he studied medical school for five years he wrote her and he said Miss Thompson today I'm graduating from John Hopkins University she came and sat in the front seat and they called him out Dr. Theodore J. Stoller MD another year went by and he said Dear Miss Thompson, I'm getting married today to the girl of my dreams. Will you come and sit in for my mother? And she did. My friend tonight, I preached a little old sermon on this first night. But because she took a moment of time to invest and change the direction of that boy, it changed his life forever. But right now, right now, Brother Sean, right now, right now, it's hamburgers, it's, it's, it's bubble up, it's pop, it's ice cream. No, there's something else in here. Would you bow your head and would you close your eyes? The Lord said my word would not return void. His word has gone out of this audience. Would you stand to your feet? Would you stand to your feet and close your eyes and lift your hands toward heaven? And I'm asking God Almighty to walk into your aisle. And if you have not yet surrendered your life, if you're fooling around, if you're backslidden in your heart, if you're cold and indifferent, if you come to this camp meeting and you're a little bit desperate because you haven't felt God in a while, why don't you take the greatest moment on the first night and the first time in the first altar call and step down here right now. Why wait till Wednesday? Why wait until Friday night? Come on, folks. The altar's open. Jesus is here. Would you take a moment of time? Would you let Jesus change your life? Come on down right now. Run to this altar. Walk fast. Ask people to let you by. Come on down. Repent of your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you of anything. Come on down and say, Lord, here's my body, soul, and spirit. Come and give your life again to Jesus. Why don't some of you rededicate yourself to this camp and say, I'm going to make this the greatest camp I've ever had. I'm going to make 2010 the greatest camp I've ever had. It all happens in a moment. It happens in a decision. It's a change of an attitude. It comes with a spirit of humility and repentance. Come on down tonight. Repent of your sins. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name. He'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. This is the end. Here I come, Lord. Halabotomoshi katalalabaha. One moment of time that changes my whole life. One moment of time that changes my whole direction. One moment of time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Sunday night, I come to you, Jesus. This is my daily bread. Creating in me a clean heart. Renewing me a right spirit. Stir up the gift within me. Touch me one more time. Touch me one more time. Touch me one more time. Touch me one more time, Lord. I give you my body, soul, and spirit. Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Stir up the gift within me. Set me on fire, Lord. Put a new burden in my soul for the lost. Touch me again. Touch me again. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Touch this ministry this week. In Jesus' name. Touch every ministry, every department of this church, in this campground, in this district. Hallelujah. Rebaptize us. Reunite us. Bring us together in one mind of one accord. God, send revival in Thorpe. Send revival through the section. Send revival on the presbytery. Send revival, God, to every family and to every marriage. In Jesus' name, I surrender myself, Lord. Take this moment and change my life. Take this moment and change my life. Take this moment and change my life. Sunday night. I know it's hot. I know you had a Sunday service. I know you drove to camp and you're tired. But there's something about unity and cooperation. I wonder how many in the building tonight, if it's one foot closer, you'll step out in the aisle and you'll come one foot closer to this altar. And you'll lift your hand and you'll say, God, let me be that person in a moment that you use this week. God, let me praise somebody through to the Holy Ghost. God, pray me back through to the Holy Ghost. Touch me again with the power of the Spirit. I wonder how many would come one foot closer, would come one, one little bit closer and say, God, touch me in a moment. And I, 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 I can't get to everybody. Lay hands on somebody next to you. Pray to the person next to you. 